These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is Whispers on the Wind. Written, narrated, and edited by James Barnett, a.k.a. Jimmy Horrors. I lived amongst rolling green hills and deep and often dark woodland areas. Through my youth, we were warned to stay away from the shadow of every tree, for in the shadows the fame may be. Us children wondered at the thought. What our parents tried to use as warnings only served to pique our innocent curiosity. Something that I would regret, eventually. As a child, I never once saw a fae, not even a hint. No fairy rings, no fairy mushrooms, no dancing pixies. Some of my friends claimed to have seen them, but they would always admit that they were making it up. We'd give them hell about lying, but we were all just deeply disappointed that we were one more step away from proof. We were a creative bunch and the stories told us that we could make contact with the Fae and get everything we desired. But only the smartest of us could do this. Because the Fae were smart, you see. They were widely known for their one-sided deals. Deals that could land you in Fairyland. Stuck forever. All of our young community were anxious to find the wondrous creatures that our parents told us about. Well, really, they were just trying to scare us away from those woods. Lots of children would go missing around our area, but we chalked it up to them running away from home. You see, that had happened before. The brother and sister wandered off for days. The search parties went on for weeks, until the parents just gave up on it. A week later, we found the two bodies sitting under a tree, shriveled to husks in a final embrace, only recognisable because of their clothing. Their bodies were still warm like they had only just passed, but the skin was taut and thinner than rice paper. It was so dry I thought they would crumble and float away on the breeze. That was years ago, and now it was my 18th birthday party. The mead flowed. Meat rotated over the great half, and our little town was dancing on tables in reverie. This was where I was happiest. Some grog in my hand and my loved ones around me. Some people, including my fiancée, Abby, said I enjoyed the meat a little too much. But Ma said that birthdays were always to be celebrated. With so many things out there to kill or steal you, we should always celebrate each new year of our lives as we would never again be the person we were. After one particular tough sculling bet, which I lost, I might add, I started to feel irregular in my stomach. Unsure if it was the food or the mead and knowing that I would never be absolved of embarrassment if I were to spill in front of the community, I briskly finished the conversation I was having with Abby. For some reason, she loved me, even if I was an immature hardhead, but somehow, I got her to agree to marry me. As gracefully as I could, I stepped outside of the town hall. The door clicked behind me. In my mind, I pirouetted with precision, when in actual fact I probably stumbled and hugged the walls like they were my friends. The night's chill was immediate. It sent a shiver into my bones and I shuddered. After five or so minutes my nausea remained. I stumbled further away from the hall toward a large copse of trees that stood just before the entrance of the woods. As I drew near, a poignant slow tune whispered on the wind, and I sat down, mostly out of fear of releasing the contents of my stomach, and also to help stop the spinning that had gotten worse as I drew nearer to the tree. I leaned against it and the rough bark scratched my back through my shirt. My head felt weighted down and I looked up at the night sky. The music grew louder on the wind exponentially, and the stars started to spin, leaving trails of light that built on top of each other. The nausea dissipated quickly and was just as quickly replaced with elation. An elation that started to build. Slowly at first. But then it followed the speed of the pan flute melody that now played unnaturally loud. It made my heart feel as though it would burst with happiness. My eyes slowly narrowed 
I saw dancing figures in my peripheries with small pairs of golden orbs that moved side to side. The melody hit a crescendo and the creatures reached to the stars. The world went black. I awoke to the chirp of cicadas and the air was warm and sticky like summer. It was an odd sensation, as the celebration I was at was a winter one. The night sky was dull but still full of stars and the tree I sat under looked dried out and dead. Confusion washed over me and I looked around. A ring of small mushrooms surrounded the base of the tree just beyond my feet. I didn't remember those being there when I first walked toward the tree but I had been quite drunk at that point and maybe I didn't see them. A flash of memory crossed my eyes and I saw the creatures that were surrounding me before passing out. I laughed out loud. My friends would never believe what I had to say, but there was no way I could keep this to myself. I jumped to my feet and brushed off what appeared to be dried flowers placed intricately on my shirt. I wondered at the amount of time I must have been unconscious. I was sure that the tree was luscious and green before I did. Maybe my friends were playing a trick on me and moved me while I slept. Surely I wasn't that drunk. Was that them that surrounded me wearing costumes? Surely not. The creature's legs were skinny. Their torsos were bloated and looked as though they had malnutrition. They had arms so long they could touch the ground with them at full height if they weren't busy flailing them about. They were a grotesque sight with eyes of vibrant yellow. Surely my mind wasn't that far gone that I was hallucinating. I took a step, confident that I'd just witnessed a group of fae. I headed back to the hall. Hopefully the party was still going. One can't miss their own 18th birthday, after all. As I grew closer to the hall, a pit of dread entered my stomach. The hall looked old and dilapidated. The symbol of the horse was still above the door, which was the symbol of our community. My stomach turned and it felt like someone was poking it with a stick. My mouth was dry and my legs wobbled as I got closer to the door. There was something serious going on. Praise the mother and let her bless me with happy news, but I knew that it wasn't good. I knew my life would never be the same again. Everything about what had happened so far felt wrong. I stepped onto the flagstone step in front of the door when an owl hooted at me from the roof of the hall. I stopped and looked up at it. Its eyes were bulbous, intense and searching. It opened its wings and gave a hoot before taking flight. Its dark spotted wings camouflaged against the stars and I watched it rise and start to circle the cabin. The sound of a metal click broke me from my distraction and I realised it was the door to the hall. I stepped back off the step and lost my footing, falling on my rump in the dust, managing to twist my ankle in the process. The door creaked open as I focused on rubbing my tender ankle. A sweet smell wafted out the door and I recognised it as toasted honey cakes, something my ma used to make for me when I was a child. I looked up and a woman stood just inside the door, firelight emanating from behind her a large white shawl across her shoulders and pulled tight in front of her by her hand. Oh dear, what have you done to yourself? She said as she stepped forward and glanced down at me with squinted eyes. I hopped to my feet but couldn't put all my weight on my right foot. I'm so sorry. I was just trying to... I stared at the old woman's face and a hint of recognition sparked in my memory. I'm sorry. Who are you? I'm the owner of this hall. If it's okay with you, I'll be the one asking questions. She gave a little frown, and I could see the forming cataracts in her eyes which also had a yellow tinge to them. Um, okay. I rubbed my ankle and a shooting pain tore through the nerves in my leg. I'll ask again, who are you? Your voice has a distant memory in it. I must apologise for my appearance. I'm quite blind. She pointed to the whites within her eyes price of love. My name is Charlie. This was the main hall of my community. I looked around and the houses of the village were all gone. Only charred remains that stood up like burned matchsticks. 
Oh, my mother, she said, and wobbled a little on her feet until she grabbed the door. A tear ran down her left cheek and she stepped forward and touched my face. Her thumb ran over my eyebrow and she gasped. Please, come inside and be careful of that ankle. She turned and hobbled away, leaving me more than a little confused. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and I shivered even though the night was warm. I followed her through the door and shut it, closing the clasp as I had done a thousand times before, only now the metal had a build-up of rust that made it difficult to close. With some coaxing it gave a loud click and I turned around. The old woman was sitting in front of the fire in a wing-back chair, a book in her hands. Come, take a seat across from me, she said, her voice wavering. I've been waiting so long for this moment to come. I hobbled over to the chair across from her. The floor groaned in protest as I did so. Some of the boards made cracking sounds and I could see that they were termite affected. As I drew near the fire, I felt the warmth on my cheeks and a feeling of familiarity from this once glorious hearth, which now held a blaze that was just enough to keep the immediate area warm. I sat down. In the firelight I could see the woman's age-spotted hands. Her nails were yellowed with age, attached to spindly hands clearly riddled with arthritis. She opened the aged book that was on her lap, and I could see there were old photos behind sheets of plastic. She placed her hand on the first picture and pulled it out and handed it to me. It was Abby. It was Abby and me. A photo of me proposing to her with my grandmother's wedding ring. A tear rolled down my cheek. I looked up and the old woman had pulled a chain out from her shawl that had my grandmother's ring dangling from it. What? What is this? Confusion racked my brain. She smiled, and I recognized her. It was Abby, only this was a woman in her 80s that sat in front of me. She handed me the photo album and I turned the pages. Each one I turned showed my family growing older, older than I had ever seen them. I turned to the last page and opened the plastic pulled out the photo. It was my parents, as old as Abby was now. They passed not long after that photo, her voice betraying the smile she had on her face. I wish they could have seen you now. The f I stuttered. She nodded her head. Mischievous things. They burned the town down except for this hole. I started to cry. It's okay, Charlie. She put a hand on mine. You're here now. I've waited for so long. I looked up to make eye contact and a soft glow from behind her distracted me. In the shadows, I could see the figure of a creature. Its two large yellow eyes stared at me. Two horns twisted up from its unkempt hair. It placed a pan flute up to its lips and the melody started again. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. Whispers on the Wind was written, narrated, and edited by James Barnett, aka Jimmy Horace, with music by Blair Moon and Dark Fantasy Studio, and Tom Robson, and sound effect provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and Carolyn O'Brien for helping with our submission reading, and of course to Ben Errington for preparing the content corpses for their open casket funerals, performing his duty as the social media undertaker. James Barnett is the producer of the Night's End podcast, a short story fiction podcast with tales of horror and the paranormal. Search for it wherever you get your podcasts, and you can also catch other works of his at jamesbarnettcreative.com. The Other Stories is a production of the story studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means share the hell out of it. So, until next time.